But I think 2016 Medicare probably will turn out you know, roughly in line with, with 2015 and, and a couple of years before. In other words, the global economy since the financial crisis or the recovery has been running at around 3%, a little bit more than 3%, sometimes 3.5%. I think there's a very good case that that is pretty much how this year is going to end up. So we're certainly not looking for a turning point here where the global economy goes into some kind of slump. But a lot of it will revolve around what happens in China. Is this period of low growth here to stay for um, the kind of growth rates we saw before the financial crisis? Are they unlikely to ever come back? I think that would be too sweeping and maybe pessimistic of you. And, and you know, the theme here, of course, is the fourth uh, industrial revolution. And there are some question marks about are the GDP statistics actually properly capturing uh, that revolution and, and the IT revolution and in particular. Maybe, maybe there's something being missed here. But I don't think that there are grounds for being particularly pessimistic about the medium-term outlook for the global economy. It's important to get through the aftermath of the Great Recession, and there are still some legacy issues to deal with. But you know, emerging markets in particular are emerging, and they have, that means they have pretty high potential growth rates. It really becomes all about making sure that policy is uh, executed in a way that captures that growth potential. But I do want to ask you about the U.S. There does seem to be a consensus view building here that we are likely to see maybe another recession in the U.S. Would you agree with that? We would be very surprised if the U.S. was about to go into recession. I, I don't a manufacturing recession that well, the I mean, data seems to indicate? Mm, I, I don't no, think, you don't think so? I don't think so. I mean, well, the, the U.S. economy now, of course, is a service orientated economy. So you can get weakness in manufacturing and certainly there will be continuing weakness in the energy sector with oil prices uh, at the low levels. Uh, that's partly, uh, you know, essentially becoming a victim of your own success. Mm. The shale revolution has forced mm. supply onto the market and has put down the pressure on, uh, on, it, on the oil prices. So definitely there'll be some areas of weakness uh, within the U.S. economy, but the U.S. economy as a whole, again, since the recovery started in mid-2009, has been growing pretty consistently in the 2 to 2.5% two range. Uh, and I think there's a very good case to be made that that trend will continue. What does 2016 hold for the global economy? I have with me the Chief Economist of IHS, Nariman Bairavish. Mr. Bairavish, thank you so much for joining me. I saw in your most recent note, which is as of, I think, 24 hours old, that you put down this tepid, slow pace of growth in the global economy all the way back to 2000 That's and to right. factors starting then. And I was very curious about that, if you can elaborate and explain to us what you speak of in yeah. that trend. Well, basically, we have had a lot of what I call supply-side constraints, mm -hmm. including a slower growth in labor force and population. Yes. Uh, not so much maybe in India, but in, in certainly in China and in the developed world, but also a very worrisome decline in the growth of productivity. Yes. Pretty much across the board, including in India, but certainly the U.S. and Europe and elsewhere. And that's been going on for a long time. So this sluggish growth period is not something that's brand new. It's been exacerbated certainly it was by the uh, financial crisis, no question. But this is a longer term trend that we're seeing. But the sluggish growth period didn't seem visible at all in the years 2003 to 2008. Or was it just that the financial markets dominated the headline so much that we missed the underlying weakness? I think there was a lot of truth to the fact that in, indeed the financial euphoria that we saw during the 2000s, right before, certainly from 2000 to 2007, uh, masked some of the underlying slowing trends that we'd seen. So, yeah, it was there, but I think we perhaps didn't pay enough attention to it. Okay, so you seem to be indicating that 2016 we'll see global growth come in between 25 to 3%. And that because of these underlying factors that you've just detailed, we might in fact stay within this range over the next several years. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. I mean, I think the big disappointment has been that every year we think, you know, next year growth will pick up, and it doesn't. It's, it's stuck at sort of two and a half by our measure. Um, the good news is it doesn't get weaker than that, mm. even though there's a lot of crises going on and everything. But the bad news is it's not getting any stronger than that either. So we just seem to be. The, the reference, the, the, the point I make is we're sort of stuck in low gear at yes, this point. Yes. So. Mr. Bervish, what does that mean for the world? I mean, if we're stuck between 25 and 3% for the next several years, especially for emerging economies like India, where we need much higher 
global growth, not just domestically, but for the world to consume right. the products that we export as well. What does it mean? What are the risks that you see lying in wait because of this tepid growth or low gear? I think it's a much more challenging environment for the emerging markets because the export-led growth that was possible in the 1990s and the 2000s is not as easy now because world trade is not growing very rapidly and I think that export-led model is becoming weaker. So emerging markets will have to think of a more domestic-led growth. And some countries, India for example, is better equipped to do that. The domestic economy is a much bigger part of uh, the Indian economy than say China's or, or, or some of the other, Taiwan's. So, but the, the focus has to be much more on domestic growth rather than export-led growth. Okay, we just had the China numbers come in, 6.9%. Um, uh, what, what do you make of that number? What do you expect will be the China growth rate for this year and the next year to come? And therefore, what should we be prepared for? Well, we have a dilemma because nobody believes China's official numbers, but we have to use them. We have to use them. So on an official basis, we're saying this year, next year, Chinese growth is going to be about 6.2, 6.3%, much weaker than even last year. China's growth has been steadily coming down, of course. Uh, unofficially, I think it's probably more like 4 or 5%. So I think, you know, from that perspective, I think China's growth, if you look at what's going on in their financial markets, what's going on in commodity markets, you have to believe that the actual growth rate is less than the official numbers. So if we go down to 6.2%, you're then saying that commodity prices, in fact, are either stuck where they are right now or could head lower, including with crude, and not move up. I think there's a very high risk that commodity prices, including oil prices, will stay low for an extended period of time. You know, believing, if you do, that the Chinese growth numbers are going to continue to disappoint, then I think... Uh, certainly commodity prices are going to stay low for a while. Uh, for a while would mean a year or two? A couple of years. A couple be, of years. Yeah, yeah, okay. Really so I have then a quick last question on India. Um, the expectation, at least of the Indian delegation coming to Davos, is that this is the year maybe the world would be looking at India more closely because it hopes to deliver growth in the region of 7% or 65 to 7%. Um, what do you make of India's growth prospects at this point in time? We're fairly optimistic about India's growth prospects. India is a bright spot in the world world economy. It's an island of stability in the, in the global economy. So in that sense, I think it's right that India should be in the limelight. Uh, it's, it's a sort of long, long coming and well deserved. Uh, so from that perspective, I think, yes, indeed, a lot of people will start to look at India more closely now. Well, thank you so much thank for your you. time. I hope you have a good Davos. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very you much too. for the interview.